Hello and welcome everyone to our COVID-19 webinar. My name is Patty Camacho and as part of the Department of Neighborhoods, I will be facilitating this discussion. This event is scheduled to go from 2.30 to 4 p.m. today. Next slide. There are a couple of few housekeeping items I would like to mention. There is a live captioning available, which you can access using the link in the chat comment box to the left, COVID-19 webinar, DON, real-time text. The webinar is being recorded and shared, so please be sure to email COVID-19 community webinars at seattle.gov to get updates. You can also use this email address to ask any questions. This email address is also posted in the chat. We'll be taking questions throughout the webinar, so please submit your questions using the chat feature. I'll make sure to include opportunities for folks on the phone to ask questions as, as well. If you are on the phone and we would like to ask a question at appropriate times, please use star six to unmute your phone. Star six. The Department of Neighborhoods will continue to host weekly webinars every Friday from 2.30 to 4. This is our effort to try and provide the most up-to-date information to our community members and stakeholders. We also encourage you to visit the City of Seattle COVID-19 resource page, which is updated regularly. The link is also posted in the chat. The Department of Neighborhoods Community Liaisons team have created in-language videos as a resource to share information about public health recommendations and paid sick and safe time. We will be adding the link to the translated materials and the in-language videos in the chat now. The in-language videos include Amharic, Spanish, Vietnamese, Cantonese, Mandarin, Khmer, and Tagalog. Today's webinar is focusing on the latest updates from the city regarding COVID-19. We will be hearing from several departments, including Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin, the Seattle Office of Sustainability and Environment, the Seattle Office of Economic Development, Seattle and King County Department of Public Health, Seattle and King County Department of Community Human Services, Seattle Human Services Department, Seattle Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, and the Seattle Office of Community Development. To begin our presentation, I'd like to introduce the Director of Seattle's Department of Neighborhoods, Andres Mantilla. Thank you, Patty, um, and good afternoon. I'm Andres Mantilla, I'm the Director of the Department of Neighborhoods. Um, as always, my thanks to the, all of our community partners uh, that continue to participate on this webinar um, and continue to give us feedback as, on the issues that you want to uh, hear about. Uh, this presentation is a collaboration with various departments. Thank you to them for, for joining us as well, as well as to King County. Uh, we have presenters, as Patty mentioned today, but today we are also fortunate to have, uh, and I would like to introduce Mayor Jenny Durkin that will join us today to provide some uh, updates and remarks. Uh, Mayor Durkin, please, thank you. Thank you, Andres, and thank you, Patty. Um, I first want to thank the Department of Neighborhoods as well as the other departments who are on this call and across government. Um, for all the work they've been doing. Um, but they couldn't do their work without you and listening to community on what we, what is the most critical and urgent needs. Um, this has been the most displacing, um, difficult event, not just for our city, but for I think everybody who lives in the city. And we also know that those impacts are not shared equally and that they were felt first by those who are already living on the margins and have been marginalized. And so we small workers and small businesses, our immigrant and refugee communities, our communities that have already suffered from, you know, generations of systemic racism. And so I couldn't be more proud of the city trying to work really hard as, as we went into this crisis knowing that it would have devastating economic and community impacts, thinking about those things that we could do immediately to try to lessen the blow and to try to get people through the stage until federal relief came. Um, and so, you know, we were able in very short order, as you know, to, to end any residential evictions or evictions of nonprofits or small businesses. We know the nonprofits are struggling and particularly community-based organizations. Some of you who are on this call, um, uh, it has been really difficult, and if you can't make it through this, it's going to be there'll be no business or nonprofit to reopen. We also worked hard to get grocery vouchers in the hands of people in the Office of Economic Development, working with Department of Neighborhoods and others, was able to to get over 6,000 families vouchers of $800 
Um, and we are able to increase that this week to, to have that program apply to workers who have been uh, suffering the effects of the COVID shutdown. We also know that there's so much more we can do, and we are listening to you, creating an art fund, creating a program with United Way for rent relief and rent supports for the month of April. So we know that individually this has been the most challenging event that I think the city's ever been through. And we also know what it is done, not just to individuals, but to families and to the community-based organizations that everyone relies on as their connector. And so know that we at the city are working very hard to listen to you and to provide the kind of relief that is necessary. I also know that as the federal government relief comes in, there's many people who are excluded from that. We worked really hard with our federal partners to make sure, for example, that gig economy workers could be included in unemployment even though they weren't employees. But we also know there's, a, there's many, many people who don't have documented status, who don't qualify for federal programs. And so we were very conscientious at the beginning to make sure that our programs and the programs of our partners at King County, United Way, Seattle Foundation, were open to everyone. But we also know that means there's more work to do in each of those communities. So I want to thank all of you for providing Seattle the resilience it needs to get through this really hard time, to do the really hard things that we've asked everyone to do. And I, I encourage you to keep participating in this. Let us, let us know what you're hearing, because even though we can't come together physically, we still need to be connected as a community. And we still rely on you um, and your connections with your community so that as we navigate this really hard time and move through each phase, we're really thinking about how do we do it equitably? How do we make sure we're delivering services and opportunity across the city, but also focusing on those communities who have been left most behind? And I, again, I just want to thank Department of Neighborhoods for doing this and all the people from the city have been working around the clock it has made me enormously proud to see people willing themselves to work long, long hours, you know, sometimes 15 hour days in the first weeks that we were experiencing this, but doing it because they draw their energy from you. They know that community is what makes this city what it is. And then if we don't do what we need to do to protect the vitality of, of community, then we will be um, it, not the city we need to be. So I know we're going to get through it. We've got still, we're, we're still in the, you know, early stages. Well, we are flattening the curve. We have way too many people still getting sick and dying in Seattle and King County. So we're going to try to be very transparent about each step along the way and what we think we're, government's going to be doing and listening to you on when we don't get it right. Because there is no playbook. All of us are doing this for the first time and know that we're trying to do the best we can for you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor, um, for uh, spending some time with us here. And I know you have to uh, jump to another meeting. Um, but um, and uh, as folks are, are typing in comments, uh, we'll make sure to address those during the question and answer period. Um, I want to just uh, quickly talk a little bit more about what the mayor was talking about in terms of providing those social connections. And we've been doing a social cohesion campaign um, called uh, Hashtag Seattle Together. And as the mayor mentioned, you know, while the city's immediate focus was on providing and is on providing basic community needs, um, you know, we're also concerned uh, with maintaining connections to resources, uplifting existing uh, supportive community bonds, and providing frameworks for positive interactions. And so the Seattle Together priorities, um, just quickly, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Patty to continue uh, the, the webinar, is we want to provide creative, artistic, and cultural content, uh, digital analog to residents, in particular to vulnerable populations, uh, by resourcing artists, or organizers, and other cultural partners. Uh, that includes uh, content made by teaching artists in the school system, art streaming services, hyper-local social engagement art. We want to support and uplift mutual aid efforts for community resilience. You know, I mentioned this in the last week's webinar, but the comment I hear most from our community partners is not like, what about me, but it's how can I help? And that is just so um, uplifting uh, to hear. So that mutual aid for community resilience uh, and recovery, driven a lot, driven by our dyna dynamic understanding of racial equity, of neighborhood level relationships, 
and about uh, digital access and understanding that there are digital inequities that exist within our system and within our city. And then finally, uh, combat combating bias in hate speech, harassment, and violence that we're seeing, uh, especially right now among uh, Asian communities in this uh, COVID-19. And we are doing this with awareness of how this could have impacts on uh, on those communities and uh, and communicating things like surveillance and additional police resources to um, to report those impacts. So we're going to continue to report out on, on Seattle Together um, weekly here. Um, we are uh, uh, putting this together week by week. Um, and just at a core, it's it's about how do we support community members who are unexpectedly homebound and in search of those connections that will help ease anxiety, mental strain, and social isolation. So with that, I'll turn it back over um, to uh, Patty to keep us going. Thank you very much, Andres, and thank you to Mayor Durkin. Uh, next slide. I'd like to introduce now Narita Guman from the Seattle Office of Sustainability and Environment. Narita. Thanks, Patty. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. And with the Office of Sustainability and Environment, and we are helping manage the emergency grocery voucher program that the mayor just talked about. And I wanted to provide an update for everyone today. So early on in the crisis, the city created the program and provided a little over 6,000 families grocery vouchers. And this includes $800 over the course of two months in grocery vouchers to help families buy food and other supplies at Safeway stores. And this week, Mayor Durkin announced an expansion of the grocery voucher program, and this was made possible thanks to um, the generosity of private donors and a partnership with the United Way of King County and local community-based organizations. We expanded the program to serve an additional 1,000 workers who have recently lost their jobs or face a significant reduction in hours, uh, in work hours due to COVID-19. And United Way of King County is partnering with community-based organizations to distribute the vouchers with a focus on recently displaced workers who are unable to access other forms of government aid um, due to structural or institutional barriers like language barriers, um, fear of deportation, or they may be experiencing gender-based violence. Uh, community organizations are identifying clients and households that they currently support in their work. And all of this information has been updated um, on the city's uh, COVID-19 resource page, which also includes um, FAQs that uh, include this information. Um, I also want to remind folks that while the, the city is going to continue to fundraise and expand the grocery voucher program as, as much as possible, um, we know that there's still many others who are in need of getting help with food resources. And in addition to grocery vouchers, there are also many, uh, also many community-led efforts to combat food insecurity and get food to folks. And these efforts are organized by both city departments and nonprofit organizations who are leading the effort to coordinate grocery delivery services and meal pickup sites. And so I would encourage people to um, continue visiting the mayor's COVID-19 resource page. It is updated daily with new information um, and the information is available in multiple languages. Um, so it's, it's a great place to stay up to date. Thank you very much, Narita, for that information. Uh, moving on, I would like to introduce Heidi Hall from the Office of Economic Development. Heidi? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, just a couple of quick updates from the Office of Economic Development. We are working with our partners in Seattle to support small businesses and workers that have been impacted by COVID-19. We have a comprehensive resource page that's been launched on OED's webpage that compiles all the different resources and supports for workers and for businesses. So if folks are looking for a summary of different resources available, please feel free to check that out. That's at the Office of Economic Development's website. We also have a team of staff uh, dedicated to providing direct assistance to small businesses and nonprofits to apply for loans and other assistance through the Small Business Administration. 
So anyone can call our office 206-684-8090 to get that assistance. Um, I do want to share an update though that yesterday we learned that the initial funding is, that was uh, committed in the CARES Act, that was the Federal Relief Act that was passed March 27th, I believe, um, for small business supports that go through the Small Business Administration for the disaster loans and the Paycheck Protection Program. That funding has been spent as of yesterday. And so we are hoping that there'll be additional funding put into that program uh, with the next relief package and should know more next week. For those that are hoping to apply still, the recommendation is to organize documents, you know, still call our office. We can organize, organize your documents, pull together information on expenses for 2019 so that you're prepared to apply. Um, a couple of things around uh, unemployment benefits. Again, that's through the State Employment Security Department. There were expanded unemployment benefits put in place through the CARES Act uh, that, that included additional um, funding per week for benefits as well as extended um, weeks to claim benefits. One of the new categories is the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, which provides eligibility for workers that were previously ineligible. So that would include our independent contractors and our gig workers. So they'll be putting new rules in place this weekend. Uh, so for folks that maybe were denied unemployment previously, this would be the opportunity to access some of those benefits. Again, that's the new Pandemic Unemployment Assistance category. And um, OED sponsors a weekly small business webinar Wednesdays at 11 o'clock. And this Wednesday, we will have somebody from the Employment Security Department on that call to talk further about these pieces. Um, and there is a new eligibility tracker on the ESD website. And I'll put that link in the chat so that everyone has, it, um, has access to that. And I think those are the main updates for now. Happy to answer any questions. And like I said, feel free to reach out to our office if folks need assistance um, accessing some of those small business resources. Thank you. Heidi, thank you Heidi, very thank you much. much. Uh, I'd, we'd like to add a, a, one more speaker um, on our recurring department area. Uh, I'd like to invite Robin Kosky from Office of Housing to talk a little bit about rent relief. Robin? Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me on the webinar today, and I appreciate all of the people who are taking the time to listen in. Um, first of all, I just wanted to talk a little bit about something that some people may have heard about. Of course, we have a local uh, eviction moratorium that Mayor Durkin very quickly put into action at the end of February. But yesterday, the governor also announced uh, an, an extension to his statewide eviction moratorium that will be in effect until June 4th. It does some interesting additional things that will be very helpful um, to people who are having trouble paying their rent. First of all, it prohibits all residential evictions and also any sheriffs from taking action on any eviction orders. It prohibits late fees, uh, just as we have in our local uh, eviction moratorium. But it also says that uh, the tenant can, a tenant cannot be uh, required to pay the full amount of rent at the expiration of the moratorium. So what that means is, is if you were a person and say, for example, you couldn't pay your rent in April, May, or June, uh, and you, your rent was $1,000 per month. That would mean that, of course, even though the moratorium is in effect, rent is still due. You can't be evicted, but you are still responsible for the rent. Um, then at the end of that three-month period, you would have $3,000 due if you hadn't paid any of your rent. This moratorium means that the landlord has to set up a payment plan. They can't just say on you know June 5th, sorry, you have to pay $3,000 or I'm going to evict you. Um, so that's a very considerable new protection that's been put into effect. Um, there is also um, what I think you could call in sort of common um, terms a rent freeze. Uh, it basically says that property owners 
aren't allowed to increase rent on commercial or residential properties at this time. Um, I did ask a clarifying question to the governor's office today. If a rent increase was put into effect before uh, today when the moratorium went into effect, then that rent increase would still be allowed. Um, but any rent increases, even if you had sent a letter to someone saying you were planning to increase their rent and that, you know, on May 1st or um, whenever that date might be, um, you're you're not, you're prohibited from doing that um, under the governor's new eviction moratorium. So um, quite bold action by our governor um, last evening. I also wanted to highlight, um, you know, the best way uh, to help people who are having trouble paying their mortgage is to contact the Washington Home Ownership Resource Center. And when I'm done speaking, I will put the link into the chat um, and the phone number into the into the chat so everybody has it. Um, but um, you know, we were trying to give some advice to people about if you have a federally backed mortgage through Fannie or Freddie, or if you have this kind of mortgage, I think it's very confusing for people to try to figure out, especially when they're in a crisis, exactly what kind of mortgage they have. So the best thing to do is to suggest that if they are having trouble, whether they can't pay their whole mortgage or they can't make the payment at all, that they should call the um, Homeownership Resource Center. And, um, you know, most banks are offering forbearance and foreclosure protection. The the government, and if they're a federally backed mortgage, then they are required to do that. Um, but they can really help people, you know, figure out what the best course of action is. Um, the other thing that I will say is that, you know, it's really, really important to encourage people to act quickly because there's more that can be done, you know, if you only have missed one mortgage payment than if you start, you know, missing multiple payments. It's much easier to, you know, get something in place with the bank if you get in there early. Um, the last thing I wanted to touch on was just about rent assistance. United Way, uh, the home base program in partnership with the city and the county and some philanthropy opened a rent assistance program last Friday and last Monday. And unfortunately, that program is now closed down um, because there was about $5 million available. And in just two days of being open, there were more than 6,000 applications and there's only really enough money to help 2,000 households. Um, I think, of course, you know, one thing that probably isn't a secret to anyone on this webinar, um, but, you know, it did certainly demonstrate that there's a tremendous need for rent assistance out there in the community. Um, and, you know, the city and our partners are continuing to look for ways to provide additional rent assistance. Um, so, um, but and the governor's additional actions and the mayor's actions to, um, you know, put a moratorium on evictions do at least, you know, keep people at status quo. Um, and so hopefully we can figure out some more ways um, to have additional rental assistance. And hopefully the unemployment insurance that Heidi uh, spoke about will also help people out. I think that's all that I had for today. So I appreciate being here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Robin, for being here and giving those uh, updates on rent assistance. Um, now, uh, if we can go to the next slide, I would like to introduce Matias Valenzuela from Public Health Seattle, King County. Matias? Uh, thanks, Patty. And um, thanks to the city for the partnership and to all the community members and leaders that are on this uh, webinar. So, um, Matias Valenzuela for COVID-19. I am directing our community mitigation branch. Uh, really, um, in simple terms, it's around stopping the spread of COVID-19. Also, uh, we are doing, so all the non-medical and health things that need to be done, uh, but also addressing um, kind of broader needs in terms of socioeconomic needs, mental health needs. Um, we have about uh, nine task forces. We have a pandemic community advisory group and other things to support community um, throughout this. In terms of, um, and I think now people have come, uh, become very familiar with curves. Um, so we know right now we are uh, in the, uh, have an order through the state through May 4th. Uh, the key component of that is, um, uh, that we are uh, physically distancing. So this slide uh, in terms of showing both the campaign and I think this the campaign that we have uh, really reiterates some of the messages that were said earlier by the mayor and by Andres 
too about how can we uh, you know physically be apart but actually this is a time to build community resiliency so this is what we're trying to do through our messaging and through our campaigns when we look at this, uh, the, the, the chart here, this is locally produced by the Institute of um, uh, Health Metrics and Evaluation that produce data and modeling uh, uh, countrywide, but produce things for our own region and the state of Washington. There's some things that we can draw uh, conclusions from. There's uh, modeling that covers deaths, there's modeling that covers uh, hospitalizations, that covers cases. In terms of this, um, I think really importantly, we can uh, conclude that physical distancing has worked, uh, that we have uh, flattened or and bent the curve, both in terms of cases and in terms of uh, deaths. Um, but really important, I think, is what shows here in the future, what, what is in store for us uh, in terms of if we were to uh, stop social uh, distancing, this, this modeling here shows that if we were to do it on 4.10 uh, on the 10th of, this, uh, of the month or the 22nd, uh, uh, of the month, uh, what we would see in terms of increasing um, uh, cases and, and in this case deaths and preventable deaths. So I think the message, and I know there's a lot of um, debate or, or conversation, especially at the national level and a lot of pressure to reduce um, the the measures, but we know um, for, for us and for right now that we need to, how important it is to maintain the course, at least for the time being. Um, I will talk in a little bit just about what, what will be coming next, but um, I think that's extremely important that what we're doing is extremely uh, effective and what we really need to have is some consistency in terms of very minimal um, uh, transmission in the community and we're moving definitely in the right direction. So just wanna thank the just great community response that has been to uh, follow these measures. I think there is uh, also, if you read the news and, and uh, see situations like in Chicago, other places, some very alarming um, data um, and uh, concerns around who is being disproportionately impacted. I would have to say that when this first started, that's where my brain went right away in terms of the communities that have been marginalized, how they're gonna be impacted by this. Those are not receiving the information due to language access issues. Uh, those who have the, you know, just due to structural racism uh, are going to be uh, access to health care, et cetera, are going to be disproportionately impacted. So um, we don't have complete data because uh, there's some limitations to what gets reported and what gets tracked. But what I can say, and this is as of uh, last week, uh, one week ago, uh, and it's about 55, 51% of the confirmed cases. And we, there's, um, you know, limitations to this data in terms of um, who's being tested, small sample size, you know, so it's not very robust and all of that. And this was, uh, we're doing other interviewing and other things to get more comprehensive picture of this. But I think um, in these categories, confirmed cases, hospitalizations and deaths, just what we're seeing at this point, uh, we are seeing that among uh, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders and uh, the Hispanic Latino or Latinx community that we are seeing um, uh, higher uh, rates. The numbers are still relatively small, but you can see that we are seeing higher rates. If you look at uh, Hispanic Latinos there, for example, um, it's 17.1 higher than, uh, which is 10% um, uh, for the rest of the population. We are not seeing uh, the same uh, differences by race ethnicities in terms of hospitalizations, and we're not seeing uh, also a similar, um, you know, uh, in terms of actually whites, we are seeing uh, high rates among, uh, in terms of deaths, we're seeing higher rates among whites. And some of these things are just, since the numbers are small, for example, we had some uh, cases in, in like long-term care facilities out in the east side where we had large numbers of deaths. So those are really driving uh, the, the numbers now. But I think with time, we should be having a clearer and clearer uh, picture. Unfortunately, I think just what this means in terms of an early indicator and it's just uh, uh, our, our, uh, how important it is to continue to put an emphasis on our immigrant refugee communities and our communities of color and those who are uh, uh, lower income. One of the things too that's really important is we at, at the county and public health health in county, we're advocating now at the state and to the state board of health to have more 
uh, comprehensive tracking of race and ethnicity uh, for labs and in healthcare settings, because right now when you have for chemical diseases, not just COVID, but for any other ones, you don't, uh, race and ethnicity are not tracked. So this is actually a very time intensive effort that King County is doing right now just to be able to capture uh, this data. So just looking ahead and we've, I, I covered what has been, um, a, a bit where we have been and how we've been um, really flattening the curve, I think it's really important, but uh, there is a lot of um, pressure and interest to adjust our community mitigation uh, measures. I was also uh, personally part of a, a federal task force convened by the CDC and FEMA uh, focusing on reopening America and more and more um, frameworks are being released um, and here in our state to local uh, health and um, others are working with the state and combining efforts with the state of Oregon and Washington to really align in our uh, approach. Um, but this, it's really important to also um, realize that what we need, at least from a public health perspective, to be able to really begin to adjust the mitigation measures is going to in, in, involve a number of things that, in fact, we don't have in place yet. So really thinking about we're going to have to have really widespread availability of testing for COVID-19. And we all know the, the, the challenges that have existed there. Uh, we also need to have a healthcare system um, that is prepared to really uh, be able to admit the critically sick. Uh, and we know um, right now it's the, the situation is um, is manageable, but um, if we were to loosen up uh, restrictions, uh, and the measures we're going to have our healthcare system really overwhelmed. So really thinking about and being prepared to actually uh, take on newer cases because we will see an increase once we do adjustments to the measures. Also, um, and this has been a national concern, the, the lack of personal protective equipment um, for healthcare workers and others in the community who need to care for patients. So this is still a struggle to actually be able to have we're having to prioritize to uh, some of our top tiers in terms of healthcare providers. So there are many others, even um, so, some folks on the front lines that are not even having uh, the personal protective equipment that is needed. And even as we think about this too, I know there's a lot of others that are falling to the essential worker categories, people working in grocery stores, people um, you know, riding, driving the buses or whatever it may be, we don't actually have uh, enough uh, personal protective equipment to really be able to cover all the essential workers. So these are some of the key things that are going to be critically important to have. Also, um, really having uh, capacity at both the county level at the state level to conduct rapid uh, uh, testing uh, and being able to do also uh, widespread uh, case investigations, contract case uh, uh, tracking, uh, this, these are things that we're do, we were doing early on when we were having the first cases. We were actually doing investigations in very, and we would follow up on every single case. Once you have widespread community transmission, you stop doing this. But uh, once we reduce the transmission, we want to get to a situation where we can are able to investigate cases and do that contract tracing. But that's going to take a huge amount of labor and a system. We're working on those systems with the state as well right now, but we're not necessarily there yet. And we will know that we will have a lot more people getting sick and being in situations whether they're uh, houseless or whether they live in multi-generational households where they have to be isolated and quarantined so we have to have the right uh, facilities to be able to support them so those are some of the key things and then there are also other things that are uh, that are still uh, going to be uh, important might not necessarily be um, all, all in place as we release these but this is also thinking more long term uh, antibody testing or um, uh, serology testing, also known as uh, treatments, so things such as antivirals and other treatments, and then eventually uh, a vaccine. So, um, so these are the, some of the things that we are uh, looking at that we are trying to address, and we always, as we work with um, uh, the state, we work with um, the city of Seattle and others to figure out the next steps and how do we release uh, and adjust the measures. We take these into considerations. Plus, I think it's just really important we uh, want to acknowledge the the huge sacrifice and the weight of the you know socioeconomic and mental health impacts that this is having, especially on our low-income communities, our communities of color, and our uh, immigrants and refugees. I think it's just a very hard time for all of us. So. Um, I think uh, with that, that's uh, what I have. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Matthias. Um, at this time, I would like to open it up to people on the phone. If you have any questions you would like to ask to any one of the speakers we've heard so far, please do so now. To unmute your phone, you can hit star six. Uh, I will also be going back through the chat to catch any questions that may have come up um, that one of those speakers can address. So opening it up to any questions. Okay, there was a question in the chat feature asking about the, um, from Amanda Richter, I would like to know how we are tracking the infection rate of our unhoused. Uh, in addition, she asked, what are our plans to actually house people rather than having them use common facilities? Um, is there anyone, a new presenter or anyone from a department on the line who could answer that? So from, uh this Matthias, from a public health perspective, I can talk about just the, the testing. I think there are uh, two settings that are of high priority for us, I would say, and these are um, uh, the homeless shelters and the long-term care facilities. So this is where we, um, you know, and the county does have public health, have um, teams that are responding um, really as a kind of these um, strike teams don't like the name, but that's what they're calling them. And they're actually going and addressing issues as they arise, because these are um, really uh, places that we need to be able to um, address early. It's either uh, people who have underlying health conditions or older. So we need to be able to uh, stop transmission quickly. And those are also prioritized for, um, you know, especially the, the homeless population for isolation and quarantine when necessary. Thank you. Um, are there is there anyone on the phone who would like to ask a question? If not, we can move on. I have a question. Um, this Please. is Salam. Um, I have a question about. Um, I've noticed that a lot of the federal and state level um, resources, especially financial resources for folks who've lost jobs or businesses who've lost, uh, you know, are not able to operate. There's been resources like the SBA and all that that you know were open for a very short time, and then it's kind of like first come, first serve. And as we know, many of our immigrant and refugee communities might need translation. They need more support to fill those out. And by the time they get around to filling them out, they're already, um, you know, like the money has run out. And it's been really frustrating to support to support individuals in my community who who are gonna, it's gonna take a little bit longer for them to fill these things out. So I'm just curious what county and um, city is specifically trying to do around that, whether that be advocacy towards the state or um, particular programs that's being provided because yeah, these resources seem to be running out before communities that are most impacted actually even get a chance to apply for them. Definitely, I'm um, wondering if Heidi can speak a little bit to that. Yeah, and Asalam, thank you for bringing that up. It's been really, really challenging because um, we do know it takes longer to get information out. Some businesses have barriers because of language or technology. And, you know, even if we're doing everything on our end to get information out to our partners, to get, you know, and the federal agencies have been slow on translation. So there's been some work done at the city to try to, to fill that gap. Um, so it has been a big challenge. Um, you know, we've been working with our neighborhood partners, our community partners, and community liaisons through the Department of Neighborhoods to try to uh, facilitate that information and support out. Um, but that has been a huge challenge. I do know there is some advocacy with um, our congressional leaders around that, concerns raised about um, you know, the, the challenges for our most vulnerable community members to access these resources when they are put out, as you mentioned, in a first come, first serve basis. So there is advocacy happening through our congressional leaders. Um, I don't know if someone on the line can talk a little bit more detail about that, but there, and so if folks, it's really helpful to hear that, to reinforce kind of the concerns that we have heard as well. And so we pass that on uh, to inform that advocacy specific to the Treasury and uh, to our congressional leaders as well. And I know there's some coordination going on with the 
uh, governor's office as well, because these concerns are broader than just Seattle. Patty, this is Andres. Um, Heidi, you might also talk. I mean, one of the things that we learned very quickly and, and uh, heard from community is a is that on our resources, to the extent that we can, uh, not using a first come first serve, but really using a prioritized list. Um, I think the Office of Economic Development in their grants um, of uh, using com what was called community development block grants were able to uh, give that priority or that that filter uh, to address some of those issues that you've uh, you've raised, Heidi. I don't know, um, and I know yeah, that I can, yeah, I go can ahead. talk a bit about that if you want. Um, yeah, it's a really important point with um, keeping it open for a certain period of time and then doing um, not specifically intentionally not doing a first come first serve basis on the stabilization fund and then prior you know having a higher proportion of awards selected from high displacement risk neighborhoods and so any of the resources that the city is providing being very, being very conscious about that to and so the challenges are more with the federal resources So uh, the city continues, uh, as Heidi was saying, this is Andres, to uh, to advocate um, through our congressional delegation for expansion of resources um, for additional um, translation services, as Heidi was mentioning, and and uh, a more open process. So we can uh, next week uh, bring on some more information around that uh, specifically as as the next stimulus package begins to uh, take hold. Uh, so uh, thank you for raising those questions. Patty. Thank you everyone for that. Um, I'd like to move on now um, and continue with King County. Um, Callie Knight from King County. Uh, she'll be giving some standing updates on COVID-19 response facilities. Callie. Hey, thanks so much, Patty. Um, really appreciate having the standing agenda item and for the partnership with Department of Neighborhoods. Really appreciate all of you. Um, hey, everyone. Callie Knight here with Executive Constantine's office. Um, I'm working with a team of outreach professionals to lead the county's outreach and engagement around the siting of COVID-19 response facilities. Um, those are isolation and quarantine facilities, assessment and recovery centers, as well as shelter de-intensification facilities. And we have a few of those located within the city of Seattle. So we have um, isolation and quarantine facilities um, up at Harborview and the former Harborview Hall 24-7 um, uh, enhanced homeless shelter and one at uh, North Aurora. Those are both operational. Um, we have a the shelter de-intensification site for the Harborview Hall 24-7 shelter is at our former archives building on 12th and Yesler. We have a site that we're setting up in Inner Bay that this, the use for that site will either be an assessment or recovery facility or a shelter de-intensification based on what the need is, but that use is still being determined. Um, and then we have an unopened assessment and recovery site slated in SOTO. Um, so those are the facilities that King County is working to stand up um, within the city of Seattle. Um, I think yesterday we had 74 individuals who were staying at um, isolation and quarantine or assessment and recovery centers countywide. Um, those are open again at Harborview Hall in North Aurora in Issaquah and down in Kent. And then last weekend we opened our first um, uh, assessment and recovery center up in the city of Shoreline. Um, so that was operational this week and beginning to um, accept uh, clients. Um, with that, I want to just pass it over to my colleague Brad Feingood at Public Health Seattle King County. He can give us an update on the case numbers in King County to date. Um, and then we can, um, if there's time, uh, address any questions. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kelly. Can everyone hear me OK? Yes, you're good. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm so thankful, first of all, uh, to be on this call. Second of all, I'm very thankful to come after Matthias um, because he did a much better job of presenting the information from public health standpoint uh, than I would or could. Um, so thank you, and thank you to everyone. Uh, just in, you know, to echo everyone um, uh, who has said this before, but on behalf of Public Health Seattle King County, just a huge thank you to the whole community, to the city of Seattle, for um, being able to, to comply with our 
you know, stay home and staying safe um, edicts it is very much um, a matter of community coming together behind this cause to um, to to work to address this cause. And there are so many um, impacts of that. Um, and the city is doing so much amazing work in along with the county to help um, try to mitigate that as best as possible. This is not um, a great uh, situation, obviously, and there have been so many negative repercussions um, from it. But just a huge thank you to everybody. It has we've really, you know, as we were one of the first uh, in the United States to have active COVID cases, um, the um, we are just super uh, thankful that everybody has rallied in such such quick time. Um, just a couple of things that I'll add to what Matthias was talking about. Um, the the you know the flattening of the curve is really not uh, COVID going away, but it's it's the slowing of the transmission of COVID, and it's the, uh, the ability of our healthcare sector to be able to keep up. And just you know just a, such thank you to the people on the front lines every single day. Um, Callie and um, Sherry Hamilton will talk have talked, and we'll talk a little bit more about you know the isolation and quarantine sites. Um, the uh, that have been in our response to, to help um, vulnerable populations and populations who can't isolate and quarantine um, on site. So a couple of uh, quick notes are um, as of yeah, as of actually uh, earlier today, the most recent numbers were reported and you can find these updated on our website at kingcounty.gov backslash COVID. But there were 331 deaths across King County um, since uh, since COVID has been here um, due to COVID, and that number is up 11 from yesterday. We have four. We have tracked 4,009, 4,902 uh, cases of COVID since um, since we started testing for COVID, um, and that is up 93 uh, from yesterday. One last point I'll bring up is the Institute for Disease Modeling, um, in conjunction with King County, put out a report earlier this week talking about the slowing of transmission um, early on this report the institute for disease modeling estimated that for every person who had covid they were transmitting covid to approximately three people and so if you do the math real quick you can see how covid grew so exponentially so quick so it would go from one person to three people to nine people um, to 27 people to uh, 81 people, I think is the math, and so on and so forth. And that's how uh, the number of people grew uh, so fast. So in this report, uh, they estimate now that the number of people, uh, for, for the people with active COVID, their transmission is down to approximately 0.75. Um, and that is within a range of 0.5 to 1 across the county. So you can see how that makes it much more manageable to be able to keep up with the curve. Um, and to be able to treat those who have active COVID. One last thing I'll say is on a national note, um, we had seen a number of days in a row where the number of national uh, cases of people who have uh, passed away from COVID had flattened or gone down. And then on Tuesday, we had an all time high across the country of 2,405 people died in one day on Tuesday. And so just to keep in mind that as, um, as the nicer weather comes and, and the uh, positive energy comes of flattening the curve, that we still need to be diligent about um, staying at home, um, limiting our trips out to the grocery store for essential needs and other things, um, and making sure that when we do go out, we're diligent about keeping um, distance, physical distancing from people six feet, um, washing your hands, um, wearing a cloth mask um, in, in public, um, and wearing gloves um, when appropriate, using hand sanitizer, all of the good public uh, health um, messaging that has gone along with it that we've all done. So I thank you all so much. Thanks for the work on behalf of Public Health, Seattle King County, everything else good that Matthias was talking about. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brad. Um, Kelly, is, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, um, I'll just say that um, every Tuesday I send up I send out an email update around our uh, facilities in the city of Seattle. Um, and so, if you would like to be added to that distribution list, I'm just going to type my 
um, email address into the chat box um, and you can feel free to reach out to me and we will get you on that email distribution list. Um, and with that, thanks so much, Patty and everyone. Thank you, Callie and Brad. Um, I just want to mention now that if anyone does have any question that either uh, we are not necessarily answering on this webinar or something you think of later, do email us at COVID-19 community webinars seattle.gov. Uh, we will be getting back to people on that email. Um, I'd like to continue our presentation and invite Irene Stewart and Angela Miyamoto from Aging and Disability Services with the Seattle Human Services Department. Irene, Angela? Hey, thank you, Patty, and um, thank you, Patty and Andreas, for having us. Um, we're really happy to have this opportunity to share information about Seattle Human Services Department's Aging and Disability Services Division and the services that we provide for older people. Um, again, I'm Irene Stewart. I manage communications for Aging and Disability Services, and I will be referring to ADS for short. Um, next slide, please. ADS is an area agency on aging, and we serve all of Seattle and King County, um, even though we're a division of a city department. We are one of 13 area agencies in Washington State and among more than 600 nationwide that coordinate services for older people, adults with disabilities, family caregivers, and more. This um, so-called aging network has been in place since 1972. Next slide, please. ADS serves more than 46,000 people every year with case management services. Oh, by the way, that's an unduplicated count. With case management services for in-home care, for community meals, home delivered meals, caregiver support, caregiver respite, kinship care, information and assistance, and much more. Especially during COVID-19, maintaining services for existing clients and providing information and assistance for anyone with an aging or disability issue are really high priorities for our Human Services Department and for Aging and Disability Services. Thankfully, we forged a really close working relationship um, a number of years ago with public health, and we have an interlocal agreement. They're one of our uh, partners. And when we realized that COVID-19 was here, we were able to collaborate with public health and other aging network advocates very quickly. An example is the COVID-19 Older Adults Task Force that um, we serve on with public health and, and other advocates uh, that troubleshoots new issues and challenges related to older people as they arise. So who's looking out for older people who are most vulnerable? ADS has more than 12,000 long-term care case management clients at any given time who are receiving in-home services. Many of them have complex needs, and with our support, they're able to stay in their own homes. Uh, in addition, we provide caregiver support, respite, and kinship care services for hundreds of people. So our existing aging network that in Seattle King County is operated by the Human Services Department. It's largely unseen by the public, but it has allowed us to check in with a large clientele at high risk of contracting COVID-19. And so who do you call if you need support services for an older person? And that could be um, a friend, a family member, yourself, or even a client or a customer. Next slide, please. ADS coordinates a service that's called Community Living Connections. And you've, if you've been listening to these webinars, I know you've heard this term before, but you may not have recognized that it was a service that um, is provided free of charge by the Human Services Department um, and specifically by Aging and Disability Services. Community Living Connections serves as the front door to most of our services. And um, not only ours, but um, services that are provided by um, community partners as well. Anyone with a question about aging or disabilities can call for professional, confidential information and referrals free of charge. And that includes um, people who need resource information for their clients or customers. Um, as of yesterday afternoon, the top concerns um, in recent days mentioned in Community Living Connections calls were food delivery, 
transportation, uh, reduce transportation options, especially during the so-called senior hours at grocery stores, and then also moving. And we need to get more information about that third item um, that was curious to us. So um, it's important to know that each area agency on aging, both statewide and across the nation, has some version of this service. And so if there's someone if you live outside of Seattle or King County or you're concerned about someone who lives even across the country, you can call Community Living Connections and you can be connected to the right advocate in, for the area that you're interested in. We're all part of an extensive national network of aging and disability resource centers and there is no wrong door. Um, who do you call? In Seattle, King County, the number to call is toll free 844 348 5464, or you can visit communitylivingconnections.org. And again, if you live um, outside of King County or anywhere else in the country, um, if you're concerned about a, a, a parent or a grandparent elsewhere, you can still call and you can get the support you need where you need it. So older people, adults with disabilities, caregivers, family members, professionals, can call to get objective, confidential information about community resources and service options. Next slide, please. I'm going to turn this over to Angela now, and she's going to talk about food access for older people, which, as I mentioned, is one of the um, top concerns right now. Um, thank you. Thank you, Irene. Um, so I'm Angela Miyamoto, and I'm a planner with Aging and Disability Services. And what you see here is a food resources map that was developed by our Human Services Department. And I believe it was shared on this webinar a few weeks ago, as well as Narita mentioned earlier on this call. And the food resources map um, highlights food banks and food meal programs, and it's updated quite frequently. So there's these tiny little dots on the map, and if you hover over the dots, details will appear about the site name, location, um, some eligibility criteria, um, hours of operation, um, contact information. So ADS, we contract with a lot of community agencies to provide meals to the older adult 60 plus population. Um, many of these agencies also provide food bags and meals through a takeout or delivery method um, just during this emergency time. So things really change quite frequently and the food map is, although it is um, updated daily, it's a good idea to check ahead of time for site um, availability because you may need to pre-order or schedule a delivery for food and meals. Up uh, next slide please. If you need ongoing meal delivery service, um, ADS contracts with two agencies um, highlighted here, Chicken Soup Brigade and Sound Generations. Um, they, all, they all offer de home delivered meals and a person can receive 7 to 14 meals a week, either dropped off once a week and um, Chicken Soup Brigade offers a variety of meal options tailored for different conditions. So if a person needs um, easy, easy digestion, a soft meal, um, dialysis, no gluten, no dairy, no fish, um, vegetarian meal. They also have a healthy standard meal that complies with the American Heart Association and American Diabetes Association recommendations. Um, they also offer grocery bags tailored for East African, API, and Latinx communities, as well as low cook and no cook options and vegetarian and vegan options. Sound Generations Meals on Wheels offers regular meals as well as vegetarian, vegan, low sodium, kosher, and halal meals. And so the slide here, if you're not able to see, um, you can get meals through Chicken Soup Brigade to call 206-957-1686, or you can also download the application online at lifelong.org slash CSB dash homebound dash senior and for sound generations you can call their pathways line at 206-448-3110 or apply online at soundgenerations.org slash our dash programs backslash food dash securities 
backslash meals dash on dash wheels backslash. I know that was a lot of information. It's also in chat, and I believe um, you can access live um, after this presentation. Um, next slide, please. So if there's a concern about is food safe um, to eat, so although food can be available and delivered to our older people, they may not want to eat it because they are worried or afraid of getting sick. Um, so currently, there is no evidence to support that COVID-19 is spread through food, and our agencies follow safe food handling guidance issued by King County Public Health on preparing and distributing food safety during this pandemic to minimize the spread of COVID-19. Um, this includes frequently cleaning and sanitizing food contact and preparation surfaces, and also practicing social distancing when preparing and distributing food. Um, we also know that food can be more acceptable if it's delivered by a friendly face or trusted source. So is there a friendly a neighbor or a friend that can help um, with food pickup and distribution? Um, next slide. So food may be one, just may be one need for older people as well as a community and a good place to call just for ongoing up-to-date resource information. Again, as Irene mentioned, is our Community Living Connections line. Um, please call them toll free at 844-348-5464 and they could really help in connecting people to resources. Again, 844-348-5464. Five, four, six, four. And do we have time for any questions right now? Yes, if anybody on the line uh, has any questions they'd like to ask ADS right now about anything they presented, um, if you're on the phone, you can use star six to unmute yourself or you can enter a question in the chat box. Okay, I'm gonna think that we're good. Uh, again, you can email any um, the COVID webinar email uh, if you have any questions. Uh, we're happy to uh, get back to people on that platform as well. Thank you very much, Angela, and thank you very much, Irene, from ADS. Um, I'd like to move on now in the presentation. Um, and invite Joaquin Wee and Uba Gardahiri from uh, the Office of Immigrant Refugee Affairs and also the Office of Planning and Community Development. Joaquin? Hello, can you hear me okay? This is Joaquin. Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, next slide. So the CARES Act was uh, signed into law on March 27, 2020. It stands for the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. And it's actually the third act passed by Congress to respond to the global pandemic. The first funded some funded COVID-19 vaccine research and development. The second focused on paid sick leave and unemployment benefits for workers. And this one is meant to address the economic fallout of the pandemic in the US. And likely more stimulus packages are forthcoming from Congress. Uh, Uba and I will be talking about if and how certain immigrants can access some of the provisions specifically regarding the CARES Act. Next slide, please. Now, before talking about that, uh, first, the CARES Act does address COVID-19 testing and treatment. If a primary care provider recommends that you access testing and treatment, you absolutely should. Hospitals and clinics do not share citizenship or immigration status information with ICE. If you are an immigrant who is insured, there should be no out-of-pocket cost to you for COVID-19 testing or for any future vaccines. If you are uninsured, uh, community health clinics or Medicaid, uh, in, in Washington it's called Apple Healthcare, or uh, a unfortunately named program called the Alien uh, Emergency Medical Insurance uh, Program. Um, can also be used for COVID-19 related treatment. And what is likely to happen for folks is if you go into a community health center, uh, they may ask, and you qualify, they may ask you to sign on to any one of these um, available uh, uh, public health programs. Uh, Medicaid provisions continue to restrict eligibility to quote, qualified immigrants, and they exclude DACA and TPS holders and other undocumented individuals. And uh, also those who have had green cards for less than five years are also unable to apply for Medicaid. Uh, additionally, Medicaid has a significant public charge risk. And so throughout this 
uh, presentation, I'm going to mention something called public charge. Uh, for folks who are working in immigrant and refugee communities, you're probably familiar with it, but it's basically a federal policy that went into effect this year that greatly expands the criteria um, under which people can be denied receiving a green card or entry into the U.S. And that's based on the premise that they are or will become what's called the federal government calls a public charge or meaning just that you're dependent on certain public benefits. So throughout this presentation, I will mention if enrollment in a program uh, carries with it a high or low public charge risk. And again, I ju just want to let folks know I'm not an attorney and I'm not providing legal advice. I am providing information that is readily available through various websites and other sources. So if you are an immigrant who is concerned about public charge, you should definitely contact our office. My uh, email will be at the end, but you can also email us at OIRA, O-I-R-A stands for Office of Immigrant Refugee Affairs at seattle.gov. And we can hopefully get you connected with a legal service provider or answer some of your questions. Uh, okay, Uba, over to you. Uh, thank you. So next slide, please. Uh, the other thing I wanted to add around safe spaces in healthcare centers, uh, despite this uh, urgent need, uh, folks are not able to uh, go into safe spaces. Um, and ICE is conducting immigration enforcement in any of the designated sensitive locations, including healthcare centers. I think somebody mentioned that earlier. And then when you look at, despite the national emergency, again, if you look at keeping spaces safe, uh, it's critical, but ICE continues to engage in immigration enforcement actions, ignoring state and local stay-at-home orders and strict social distancing guidelines at a time when non-essential non establishments are closing and people are being urged to stay at home. And there is a need for a coordinated advocacy effort to fight uh, and COVID-19 must affirm the principles that these locations are spaces that the federal government itself has long designated as sensitive location are necessary to keep immigrants, their families and greater communities safe and healthy during this time. Next. I think most of you have seen the an impact on immigrants for the unemployment insurance. Again, the CARES Act makes significant changes to the unemployment insurance programs. Uh, it extends regular unemployment insurance benefits by 13 weeks beyond uh, what states currently offer. It also institutes a completely new program designed to cover workers left out of regular state unemployment insurance programs, which will last until December. But to receive regular unemployment insurance benefits, immigrants must be worker authorized at the time they file for benefits, which also impacts uh, folks who um, don't have uh, their work uh, permits and things like that. Next. Joaquin, you? Uh, yeah, actually, go on to the next slide. Um, I, it was my bad. I actually put a slide out of order. Yes. Uh, so just uh, just wanted to mention here that the that unemployment insurance administered by a state um, department called the Washington State Employment Security Department. Uh, there is no public charge risk because according to U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, and I'll refer to them uh, as USCIS, uh, according to them, unemployment insurance is not a public benefit, but rather an insurance that is collected locally from states. It, you'll often find it on your um, uh, paycheck stubs. The city is working with a number of nonprofit organizations like uh, Seattle Jobs Initiative, and Unemployment Law Project to make in-language materials um, available to help people apply for unemployment. If you've ever navigated the USD um, Employment Security Department website, it is very challenging and they are working to make this more accessible, even much more so if you're low English proficient. So we hope to roll out um, videos perhaps and um, more in-language documents to better prepare people for applying for uh, unemployment and other newly expanded programs available to them. Uh, let's go to the previous slide. And um, and that is uh, about, yes, the paid sick and family leave. Um, so 
this is the first time that Congress has required federal paid leave for private sector workers. It's a big win for a lot of people who are workers. The CARES Act actually gives workers up to 80 hours of paid sick time starting April 1st of this year, uh, fewer if you're a part-time employee. You can access if you, uh, one, have COVID-19 symptoms and uh, take time off to consult a doctor, uh, or uh, two, are quarantined by the government or your doctor because you have COVID-19, or you're taking care of someone who is quarantined because they have COVID-19. And that, that one, that third one, is paid at two-thirds of your regular pay. Um, the CARES Act also gives additional 10 weeks of paid expanded family and medical leave at two-thirds of the employer's regular rate of pay. So this one is eligible across the board. It's a little complicated for folks who are undocumented since undocumented folks technically can't work, but um, I, we have heard reports of people who are undocumented um, at being able to access paid sick leave. Um, it's, it's something that they need to be talking to their employer about. We recognize there are, there are some issues there, and this is something that we highly recommend folks um, engage with a legal service provider if they have uh, any questions. Okay, so let's get to two slides. <laughs> no, sorry about the slide mess up. Um, uh, so it should be about economic impact payments. Um, so it should be slide 29. Um, there you go. Uh, oh, no, it should be um, way back, um, slide 29. We're on slide 33, 32, 30, uh, one more. There you go. Go ahead. Take it away, Uba. Yeah. So for uh, the recovery rebate for uh, and the economic impact payment, I know that most of you probably got your stimulus check. But what I uh, wanted to add is uh, the eligibility for this is generally restricted to individuals with social security numbers and individuals with an individual tax identification numbers who already pay taxes are not eligible, nor will any members of their households, including citizens, uh, children who are citizens who are like in mixed status family, one uh, and uh, one parent uh, is a citizen and the other one is not and also in the Somali community one of the things that I've been hearing is you know uh, a lot of times when they are uh, uh, filling out their tax returns and things like that, most of them just kind of uh, use the first three because there's not a, an incentive for the fourth, fifth one. Uh, and so they've been seeing that the, the kids who have not been claimed are not getting their $500 rebate. Um, so that's also having an impact in some of the communities who are uh, one don't have a social security number and have paid taxes the kids who are citizen and also some uh, kind of immigrant groups who have uh, and haven't been um, claiming some of their dependence on the taxpayers return you want to add the public charge risk uh yes for this one um there is no public charge risk if you're receiving this um it's not considered a, a according according to the advocates we've talked to it's not considered a public benefit um uh, however of course if you're as uba mentioned if you're undocumented or you're in a mixed status family you're not likely getting a check anyway um and so this wouldn't so the public charge issue wouldn't necessarily apply in that situation um next slide please so regarding uh, SNAP or Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Programs, in Washington State it's called Basic Food. People colloquially know it as food stamps. Um, for the CARES Act, all employment and training requirements for SNAP have been temporarily lifted until a month after the COVID-19 emergency declaration has ended. Um, the federal government also from the CARES Act must provide emergency allotments to SNAP households. They also did increase funding for SNAP across the country. Unfortunately, CARES Act does nothing to expand the eligibility for food stamps. So SNAP assistance is denied to most immigrants, especially people who are undocumented, and also for non-qualified immigrants, including DACA, TPS holders, uh, and people who have had their green cards for less than five years, there is a significant public charge risk. So if you are able to access this program, you might have a difficulty um, accessing a green card in the future, or you might have a difficulty 
um, sponsoring a family member into the U.S. Again, for situations specific to you, we recommend seeking a legal service provider. And we have a list of those folks at our website uh, that is seattle.gov slash OIRA, and you can navigate to the public charge page that we have there. We uh, encourage people to call, as, as folks had mentioned earlier, Anyone can access food bank services regardless of your immigration status. I do know that many food banks have pivoted to a food delivery model or even a drive up food pickup model. And um, there's been a number of donations from both private and public organizations to our food banks. Uh, again, you can go to seattle.gov slash COVID-19. And under the food support tab, there's a number of resources that are both place-based or community-based and that also show the maps of uh, the map of food banks around the city that are still offering enhanced services. Uh, next slide, please. Over to you, Uba. Yeah, I think uh, the folks from OED has sh that have shared uh, the small business and profits uh, who are eligible to apply for low interest and zero interest uh, funding. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I wanted to share here is the other thing that I'm hearing from the Muslim community and the Somali community is uh, most some of them uh, and. and need a Sharia compliant way to access loans or even some of them will not access loans unless it's grants. Uh, so uh, people, some folks are not actually accessing the mosques and uh, some nonprofits uh, like the Cham community had mentioned to one of our project sponsors that they, have not, they haven't been able to access the Paycheck Protection Program, for example. Next slide. I'm not going through the details in here because I don't want to repeat things that um, OED has already talked about. Uh, but on the next slide, what I also wanted to share is I think as of yesterday, uh, the SBA has reported that they're unable to accept any more lenders or applications. But um, I think both uh, Business Northwest, uh, Impact Northwest, and another group called Credit um, and Credit Loan Credit something, I forgot, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, are offering 0% uh, forgivable loans. But then again, as I said, some uh, folks who are really strict, as soon as they hear loans and interest, even with the 0%, are not accessing those. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Uh, and also, um, before I talk about City of Seattle programs and services, I just wanted to mention that if uh, if you are undocumented um, and you do own a small business, unfortunately, you cannot access any of the Small Business Administration federal loan products. Uh, they do require a social security number. Um, there, if you are a legal permanent resident, you may be able to access certain loans. It is a bit more complicated. You'll have to talk with a financial institution to learn more. Also, the Office of Economic Development, uh, they do have small business advisors who are able to help you. Uh, onto the city of Seattle. Um, to answer Salam's question earlier, there is also some advocacy that's happening around setting up a Washington state fund towards an unemployment program for workers, especially undocumented workers. And so there was a letter that went out that the city of Seattle signed on to, uh, thanks to the leadership of uh, of our mayor, and it went to Governor Inslee um, and folks in the state legislature asking them to um, for financial support specifically for undocumented workers in Washington state. And so those advocacy efforts are indeed ongoing. And then regarding city of Seattle, um, city of Seattle programs, in case anyone is unsure, um, pretty much all I can confidently say that all City of Seattle programs are available to all immigrants living in the city, including undocumented immigrants. We do not ask for your immigration status. It's actually in an ordinance that I can't even ask you in the course of my job what your status is. That would be against the ordinance and against their policy. Usage of city services has no public charge risk because it's a local program. And um, we also have information translated into at least six languages about public charge. If anyone has any specific public charge questions, and that's over at welcoming.seattle.gov slash 
COVID-19 public charge, all one word, uh, slash. Or you could just uh, go to welcoming.seattle.gov and you can navigate our blog there where we keep a lot of our translated information. Um, <clears throat> also, I wanted to mention again, we probably have been mentioning this all across this webinar, but why not mention it again, seattle.gov slash COVID-19. Uh, the site has uh, language access in it. And um, if you are overwhelmed by the amount of resources there, you can always call the Customer Service Bureau. That is 2068, uh, excuse me, 206-684-CITY, C-I-T-Y, or 206-684-2489. And you can ask for an interpreter and you can have someone talk you through some of the um, programs that the city offers that you may be eligible for. Uh, right away, you should say, I need an interpreter for blank and then they can get you connected and then stay with you to talk you through the programs. Uh, the CSB folks are working really hard to make sure that people know about what resources are available to them. So big hats off to the CSB. Um, next slide, please. Um, I also, well, this is not specifically related to COVID-19, but I just wanted to mention that um, through our partnership with uh, Facebook and El Centro de la Raza up in Beacon Hill, the, they are administering a DACA scholarship fund on a first come first serve basis until funds run out and they still have some funds remaining. The scholarship funds are available to anyone who has previously had a DACA status or um, has completed a DACA renewal application and has completed a DACA renewal application and resides in Seattle or works in Seattle or goes to school in Seattle. So that could mean that you live outside Seattle, but maybe go to school here. And the website to go to is El Centro de la Raza, one word, um, dot O-R-G, um, slash get dash help dash DACA. And um, they, will, they will meet with you over video to talk you through the process. And if folks who have DACA are concerned about having to go into USCIS for fingerprints, for instance, there's no need for that. USCIS is allowing for the reuse of fingerprints and biometrics from past um, DACA renewal um, um, applications. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I also want to talk about this new program that has just launched today, actually, called the Washington State Disaster Cash Assistance Program, or DCAP. Um, and, and effective today and available for one month in a 12-month period for all Washington residents who are income eligible and who are not eligible for other cash programs like uh, TANF, which is Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, or the ABD cash program, et cetera. If you are unable to access those programs, say because you're undocumented, then you can start applying for DCAP. And you can do, do it through one of two ways. Um, uh, Salam, this is something that may be interesting for the people you work with. Uh, you can call 877 501-2233, that's 877-501-2233. Again, immediately ask for an interpreter and they can connect you um, with, a, with someone who can talk you through the program and, or you can go to washingtonconnection.org. Uh, I'm told we're running a bit behind, so that was actually the, the one program I really wanted folks to get out there um, about um, um, about the DCAP program. There may be a slight um, public charge repercussion for a very small amount of families, but it's really um, specific and it's something that um, I, it would be better if I just talked with you about it. So feel free to email me at Joaquin, J-O-A-Q-U-I-N dot U-I at Seattle.gov and I'm happy to connect with you and talk with you more about that. And we can just skip to the next section. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you, Joaquin, and thank you, Uba. Um, if anyone has any questions on those, uh, we will get back to th those questions. Uh, quickly, I would like to pass it back to Robin from the Office of Housing. Uh, Robin, are you on the line? 
I am here. Uh, thanks for having me back. I just wanted to say quickly that Mayor Durkin is doing a number of things to advocate on behalf of undocumented people in our community. Um, she's done a couple of things. One is that um, she signed on to a letter at the federal level uh, that Mayor Garcetti in LA and over 60 other mayors signed on to asking the federal government to automatically extend employment authorization documents documents for DACA recipients. Um, Senator Murray, uh, our, our, uh, we're, who we're very lucky to have as our Washington senator, is likely to introduce some legislation around this in the very near future, and the city is following and advocating for that legislation. Uh, at the state level, also, um, the mayor has asked the state government to create a a fund for undocumented immigrants, um, an undocumented worker relief fund to provide, you know, some resources for people who aren't eligible for unemployment comp compensation. Um, and, you know, in fact, I was just on a call with the mayor earlier today where she was talking with other local mayors um, about, you know, what could be done to help those who are undocumented in our community. So just wanted people to be aware of that. Thank you very much for that additional information, Robin. Um, at this point, I want to go back. I know there were some questions that were put into the chat earlier, um, specifically for the OIRA, OPCD people. Um, I believe that Joaquin has already sort of answered them in there, but I'd like to read them out right now. Uh, from Salam, what kind of financial resources can you make available for immigrant and refugee communities? So much of the federal and state level support has run out before our population has gotten a chance to even apply for them. I believe he talked a little bit about that in there. Uh, Joaquin, was there anything else you wanted to add on that question? Uh, no, just that some of, <laughs> I just I just said no, and then here I am talking, sorry. <laughs> Just that um, the, the, some of the first round of uh, programs like the Small Business Stabilization Program, the Emergency Food Vouchers, and the um, um, United Way, King County, King County and Seattle, City of Seattle Rent Assistance Programs, um, they were wildly successful and we're fundraising for them. So we hope to open, to reopen um, applications for those in the future, please um, keep, um, um, I would say, keep uh, uh, accessing Seattle.gov and uh, the COVID-19 resource page to find out more about the resources that are going to be online coming up. Thanks. Thank you. Um, going on with other resources, there is one more resource that we forgot to put on this slide, but I would like to mention, and we will also put a link to it in the chat box, uh, Alert Seattle. Alert Seattle is a great resource for people to get updates, current updates, to the minute updates on um, one, Seattle, Alert Seattle on Seattle related um, updates, but there is also specific Alert Seattle COVID-19 that people can sign up for, the uh, emergency notification system. Um, I encourage people to, uh, that's another resource that people can use to get uh, up-to-date information. Moving on, um, at this point, uh, I want to thank all of our presenters for giving such great vital information. Um, we are very appreciative of having everyone here. Um, I'd like to know if there are any remaining questions that people might want to ask our presenters. Uh, again, you can hit star six to unmute your phones and or you can type them into the chat box. In the meantime, I would like to go over some additional community resources, give people a chance to get questions in. Um, Jessica, can we go back? Thank you. Uh, some, this is a list of some additional community resources that um, we'd like to highlight, uh, highlight on different topics. I know this slide has many different links. Um, we know that there are many efforts uh, being done by or their community for the community. Um, we also understand that this page might be very difficult to read. Uh, we are happy to get you that information um, via email as well. Um, a lot of links, uh, uh, a lot of them have phone numbers as well that I believe are toll free. Some are toll free, some are local numbers. Feel free to use this resource, community's resource page um, for to get more information um, for you and your community. 
Hi, um, Patty, this is Swang Wing. I yes. want to ask a question that I saw in the chat box, and Please. I believe it was from Amanda Richer. Um, and she asked, is there a way we can require accepting of tenants currently unhoused into empty apartments? And I wonder if Robin is on the call from OH uh, or someone from housing Office of Housing that might be able to answer that. Um, you know, the the city does have a, a you know some programs that assist people to get into private market and subsidized rental apartments, um, but you know. Um, as we know, we are a little bit limited on rental assistance funds, um, but we, you know the, the city's uh, programs do continue to operate. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's difficult to force private market landlords um, to accept um, people, but we do have a program called the Housing Connector, um, which works directly with people who are experiencing homelessness and um, does get them into largely private market apartments in our community. Um, so we are doing all that we can um, to keep that program going and active um, and they are providing additional support to people who are unable to pay their rent right now um, and that is accessed through coordinated entry um, and is also which is you know also accessed through 211 so um, that's um, my advice is to suggest that people call 211 where there are also translation services available Thank you, Robin. Uh, I would like to mention that right now, currently the time is 4.02. Um, we still have a few more questions, and if it's okay with everyone, uh, presenters and participants alike, we'd like to continue and get through some of these questions while we have people on the phone. Um, I also want, want to say that, uh, again, if anyone has anything that they would like any, any information they would like to see on these webinars or any questions that are maybe specific and they don't want to mention them here, do go ahead and email us at COVID-19 Community Webinars at Seattle.gov. Um, at this time, uh, Wang Wang, do you have any more questions you heard from community? Yeah. Yes, I've been tracking some of the questions in the chat box, and this is a question that asks, are the public restrooms safe for unhoused community um, members? So if there's someone from parks or um, um, HSD or, or maybe King County that can help answer that question. Are the public restrooms safe for our unhoused community members? Wang Wang, this is on the best. Uh, we can, um, DON's been working on siting uh, some of these uh, uh, hygiene trailers and, um, and public restrooms as well as hygiene stations. Uh, safety is, is is paramount in all of those. Uh, what I'd like to do is bring folks into next week's uh, community webinar to talk more about the specifics. So we can uh, get back to that question. Thank you, Andres. Um, the other question we have here is, what if anything is being done for uninsured individuals? The stimulus address coverage for tests, but not for ongoing treatment. The system does provide funds to hospitals. However, I'm not sure if there was any mandate to help support uninsured individuals. It is expected people will have upward to $75,000 in medical bills for cases that were extended stay is required to treat COVID. Do we have anyone on the line who might be able to address this comment? If not, we'll try and follow up with uh, some folks from um, our public health partners, and, um, and I'll just move on to the next question. Um, are we announcing testing locations? Yeah, we can put that. Um, we have testing locations that maybe uh, I don't have them in front of me, but we can follow up with a map of those. And Wang Wing, I, I I don't know if it was me or, or or if other folks experienced the same thing, but you were cutting in and out of the last question. Um, testing in general or testing is free, and um, as Joaquin, maybe you want to uh, loop back to the to some of the presentation in your slides, but um, 
uh, additional coverage for the insured is is should continue uh, to be available. Um, we'll, we'll we can also circle back on that specific question for next week. Thanks, Andres. And I just have one more here that I tracked, and um, hopefully people can hear. It says, "Can you speak about how to combat misinformation?" about COVID in the communities. There are a lot of false and dangerous information. What are some tips that you can offer for combating misinform misinformation? Yeah, this is Andres again. It's a fantastic question. And I see uh, several of our community partners on the call. Um, one of the biggest services that you can do for, for uh, either your neighborhood, your community, um, your, any stakeholders that you're working with is help share accurate information to to dispel those rumors um part of what we're trying to do is is um is as part of seattle together is, is to put out accurate information especially when it comes to things uh like the anti-hate uh campaign that oira and others are pushing forward in um the office of civil rights as well um it's so important for us to stay on the same message uh, with consistent um uh with the county, I think we've we and with the state, we've tried to really maintain a consistent message with that. We know that there's a ton of misinformation, a ton of uh, information about false vaccines, um, about false uh, things about testing. Um, in those cases, please email us uh, if you have specific questions, and we're happy to clarify. Um, but our 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 messaging and our our public information officers. Um, uh, at working out of our emergency operations center are really trying to provide consistent information um, uh, as well. And we know that some of this misinformation happens in other languages as well. So we're constantly working in partnership with King County Public Health OIRA to update and uh, and accurately translate information uh, with public health repercussions. So thank you for the question. Thank you very much, Andres. Um, at this time, I just want to thank all of our presenters who shared information with us today and all of our community members who participated in this discussion. Again, as Mayor Durkin mentioned, this could not be done without speakers and participants alike. Um, the Department of Neighborhoods will continue to host webinars every Friday from 2.30 to 4 uh, to keep our local community informed. We also encourage you to explore other resources and the community organizations and city departments have made available. Uh, again, those links, uh, the community links are uh, on the slide and uh, we are happy to email you with those slides if you reach out to us at COVID-19 community webinars at seattle.gov. The slides will also be available on the DON blog front porch, also found at frontporch.seattle.gov. Additionally, for the in-language information regarding public health and paid sick and safe time, check out the DON YouTube page that will also be linked in this chat. Our intention is to follow up with information and answers to the questions asked today. If you do not get your question asked or think of other questions later and or would like to receive updates, please email us uh, at COVID-19 community webinars at seattle.gov. You can also call us at 206-684-0464. In addition, uh, I know the Seattle Customer Service Bureau is uh, fielding COVID-19 related calls and information and their number is 206-684-2489 or uh, six, 206-684-CITY. I'd like to thank everybody again for their time. This webinar is now concluded. Thank you and have a good weekend.